Welcome to the August 14th edition of the PFF Forecast. Uh, George and Eric, we are joined by a good friend uh, that we've never actually spoken to, but have communicated with plenty of times via the wonderful World Wide Web. Um, we're going to talk to him about uh, his path to becoming an NFL uh, better, whether or not he participates in any of the syndicates that that's, or is, knows many of the syndicates that Simon Hunter uh, participates in. Uh, and talk a little bit about how he's feeling, what he thinks is going to happen in the 2022 NFL season. It's going to be a fun show. Uh, let's rock. Fabian, now I'm going to pronounce the name. I'm going to do my best uh, as someone that once lived in Germany. Fabian Sommer, uh, S-O-M-M-E-R, at Suma810 on Twitter, live from Dortmund, Germany. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. And I think you pronounce it uh, beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Eric, do you want to give it a try? <laughs> Zoma? Yes. Look at you. Wow. I'm a I'm a really good uh pronunciator. Yeah, you you are. <laughs> I mean the the Tua uh Tungavailoa crowd can can attest to that. They can they know that intimately. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Um I the first thing I wanted to ask you Fabian was where your um where your Twitter handle comes from. Is there something I don't I can't quite figure it out. Um S U U M A 810. Do you want to enlighten us? Uh, so a ten is my birthday, okay. um, and Zuma comes from um, in school. So so Zuma is the German word for summer. Mm. And uh, when we are at school, there was a um, Bundesliga player called Zibo Zizo Zuma. And someday, just completely randomly, um, a friend of mine just mixed up Zuma, summer, and Zuma, and then <laughs> all of a sudden that became my. Uh, internet nickname for the next 12 13 years yeah oh, there you go i it sounded it seemed like it had something to do with the last name but you never want to assume you know it's uh yeah. it's not it's never a good thing um why don't you start us off with kind of your journey and um how how you got into betting um how long you've been doing it what you bet you you know are you betting on the nfl and other sports or nfl exclusively can i give people who are not as familiar with you um and maybe don't follow you on twitter a little bit of uh your background yeah so i was always fascinated by gambling in general i was always a sports fan i loved looking at stats at numbers and all, all that kind of stuff and then in the 2000s, I would guess 2005 to, 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 to 2010, we had that crazy poker boom in Germany, mm -hmm. um, basically of the Chris Moneymaker era. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like you could um, switch your TV on in the evening and there was like poker tournaments, VSOP, WSOP um, on like just common uh, German broadcasting channels. And then me and some friends, we started playing poker. And in Germany, betting is legal. As soon as you are 18, you can open up some online betting accounts. And we also have like these kiosks uh, where you can go and um, do the old fashioned um, tickets and do soccer parlays and all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, And when I became 18, I think it was on, on the very first day, I opened up uh, two or three online betting accounts and uh, deposited some of my student money and just did some betting. I started with like uh, Greece volleyball, uh, women second league <laughs> live betting. And Sounds like, like Eric that. now. <laughs> and yeah, and I, I would guess like it was in the 2008, 2009, 2010 range. It was the first Rex Ryan uh, New York Jets season. And that was when I started uh, watching football because I wanted to bet on it. And then um, I found myself watching some football on Sundays and immediately I got completely hooked by the sports. Um, and that's how I got into 
um, watching football and NFL betting, and I never stopped since then. And nowadays, I'm mostly betting NFL, um, also betting on the NFL draft and stuff like that, but I don't really do any other major sports. Yeah, that's like, that's very, I think, unusual, right, for somebody who's as good at betting as you are, right? Because the NFL is really like the hardest league to beat. And, you know, there are people who can, and I think that that's, you know, awesome. I, I mean, as far as your process is concerned, like, w did you start watching it, develop intuition about it, and then just bet it blindly? Or did you, did you mo come up with a model? And like, how, how often ha have those things sort of evolved for you over the years? Yeah, so I think um, in 2010, I was just betting blindly. I was just watch, uh, looking at some random stats uh, sites like teamrankings.com and was just betting on some intuition stuff. But I also think that intuition plays a very major role in my, in my handicapping process because at the core, my process has always been the same in the sense that I try to handicap the actual matchup on the field as good as i possibly can do uh, i i try to use all the information or as much information as i could possibly get whether that's quantitative whether that's qualitative and i just tr try to think logically about what's what, what could happen on the football field what's what's likely going to happen uh, try to think pro probabilistically and i think what has changed over the years is just getting more and more data uh, learning uh, um, uh, programming language like R and basically getting to the point uh, where I can crunch numbers and data much, much faster and uh, mu in uh, much more detail. I've also um, built some models in the in over the past couple of years, like as a supporting tool, I've done power ratings and stuff, but I'm also a big proponent of self-scouting. I always try to go back and see what worked well, what didn't work well. And um, I always arrive at the same conclusion, which might be or which might be a little bit counterintuitive that all the stuff that I add, like models and power rating, basically clouds my handicapping process instead of actually helping me. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that power ratings in the traditional sense um, might be a little bit overrated and haven't really helped me because you try to compare 32 teams on a linear scale, but the NFL scoring distribution is not linear at all. So you could have like a team at plus four and a half, another team at plus two and a half and one at um, plus one and a half. So you would install the one team like a three and a half point favorites, the other team as like two and a half point favorites. But even though there's just a one point linear difference, in your rankings between team two and three, you would go through the key number of three, which is like a switch in win probability of like, I don't know, 8.5% or something, yeah. which makes it very tough in my opinion to use power ratings in the traditional sense. Um, so I've tried all that stuff. I, I, I still use some models like uh, team level models because I'm also not the greatest coder in the world. So my coding skills are somewhat limited. So I try to use that stuff as a supporting tool, but I think at the core, it's always the mental model, try to get or gain as much information as possible and um, just try to focus uh, on, the, on the matchup. So I would say that if you give me a pen and a paper on Monday mornings, you, you would tell me 15 matchups um, and I could write down 15 initial spreads out of my head and those would probably do uh, better than any model that I could possibly build. So that's been my, um, I would say, process at the core. And you always try to understand more about the game. I mean, pro football focus is also a big uh, component of my work, whether it's the um, data package or listening to you guys uh, talking <laughs> on the forecast. Um, yeah, so that's basically been Are my my core process. Are you guessing the lines with us then on uh, uh, what is, I guess, Monday morning for you guys, for you? Because uh, that it's interesting that you, uh, you know, that I'm guessing that's part of your process and you're not just kind of joking, but like actually sitting there and writing them down, you know, for me at least, it's very edifying in that if you haven't seen them yet, you realize, you know, you're able to kind of um, see your own intuition in, a, in an order of magnitude. Whereas if yeah. you've seen them already, it's very hard 
you know, to get more than a half point or a full point off of, of the spread. Right. But you have some, and Eric and I, like on Sunday night, we'll be like a couple of points off, you know, we might be through a key number yes. off and that to you is, or at least to me is really edifying. Yes, absolutely. So a very important factor for me is um, that on Monday morning, I don't want to be spoiled by any lines. So I, I try not to look at any lines until Monday morning when I get to my desk and uh, do all the weekly recap stuff. And then I start um, um, doing my first set of numbers initially because I don't want to be anchored to any market numbers. And you are you you are sometimes off on a few, but you are always going to do market regression anyway. But uh, I think uh, sitting there and doing the initial set of numbers initially really gives me a very good starting to the week because you also just think logically about a potential matchup and you are not getting anchored by by any uh, lines that are already there. Yeah. Do you think so? The only issue with that, and that's something like George and I have sort of uh, wrestled with, is this idea that look ahead lines have value, right? Like, especially later in the year where you sort of think through the permutations of what could happen, but you are sort of anchored to that. Are look aheads, are those like just too, I mean, the limits are pretty low, right? So, like, there's not a ton of value sometimes in waiting in those waters, but like, you know, there, there are. That that's like the one drawback to that approach, which I think is generally sound. Yes, absolutely. So I I always uh, uh, also sometimes look at look at numbers like the uh, Westgate Superbook is I think posting them on Tuesdays um, for the rest of the week, and sometimes you wanna get some of that look ahead stuff, uh, but I also try to uh, forget that stuff, and um, sometimes on Monday morning you you uh, look at one matchup and sometimes you know oh i remember from last wednesday the look ahead was let's say eagles plus three now it's plus two so that stuff always plays a role but um i try to not get spoiled too much by opening numbers on sunday overnight so when you so take us a little bit more through your your process through the week i guess on you know are you placing um you know, majority of your allocation on Monday, how do you, you know, how do you kind of decide, you know, if, if you're not using, um, you know, sort of a more model focused approach, how do you determine, you know, what your investment might look like on Monday, which ones you might wait on, you know, how, how do you come in with a set, you know, you kind of allocate a certain amount, you know, each week, like, how are you kind of thinking through that? And what is, you know, are you reassessing every day? Are you getting news updates? What are some of the triggers that you might get that where you might actually place, you know, a, a sizable, you know, wager on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or whatever it might be? Yes. Yeah, so on, on Monday morning, the first stuff that I do is uh, recapping the, the Sunday, uh, trying to watch as many games in the condensed version as possible. I go th through my Twitter timeline, try to catch any injury news. Then I also um, check out the all the, let's say, fantasy doctors out there that have um, some cool opinions in general, whether that cornerback's uh, hamstrings uh, look too significant. You are, um, I'm then going to estimate injury statuses for the rest of the week. Um, and basically what I do is, I start with a set of numbers, then I run some numbers, some models, um, et, et cetera, um, try to do all my potential research. And then you, uh, I basically shape my numbers throughout the week. So any uh, important piece of information could make me change a little bit in my numbers. Um, yeah, and then it's basically, hey, these are my numbers for now. Um, where do I have the most edges? Um, is there a reason to bet a game early? Um, do I expect some um, market resistance on that game? Are there some certain injuries uh, where I, I want to wait until later in the week, maybe until like Wednesday or Thursday when I can get a better estimate of uh, whether that certain player is going to play? Um, what are other groups and betters in the market playing? Um Sometimes it's also the case that someone rips the entire board on Monday morning and there are also two games that, that you like, then some value is already gone and you have to think, hey, might the game come back on Tuesday or Wednesday 
or do I have to go now because I'm expecting more groups and more betters to go on that certain side or that certain total. So it's basically like a iterative process throughout the entire week, trying to catch um, any, every piece of information, whether that's um, for the actual game or whether that's in the market, uh, what you're hearing from other betters, other groups and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's such a great like look into how somebody goes about it, how somebody's so you know diligent with looking at changes, looking at the numbers. And, and as you said, I think the biggest thing you said, you like um, what you said earlier, which is that things don't move linearly in this league. Right. So, you know, you have, let's say two, two injuries to a secondary is worth probably, you know, a lot more than two times each player's individual contribution um stuff like that that i do think like there are probably modelers who have that built up like i'm hoping you know there, there are aspects of what we do here at pff both in our old stuff and our you know new stuff which will come at some point soon um but i also think that like somebody who has good intuition on those things can really understand like can really move their numbers maybe better than most modelers do especially ones that start top down and try to like adjust as it goes on versus something that's more bottom up but even the bottom up stuff, like you have to have that backup left guard properly priced or like it's a worthless endeavor. You know what I'm saying? So um, that that's, you know, kind of, you know, that, that, that's a really uh, fun thing there. As far as, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, year to year, is there is there something like are you you're looking at some sports betting content, which is flooding the space? And then you have, and then there's obviously, I think, I think of like the work you do with Matchbook and, you know, uh, the, uh, the bet spurt stuff. And like, basically there's a group of people who are, are producing sports betting content that are pointed in the right direction, I think. And then there's a lot of noise. How do you like sort of, it is, do you ever go like, for example, like I think there are there's sports betting content that I actually look to because I know that they think about things the wrong way. And so I want to kind of, <laughs> at least know what they're thinking. So if everybody in the world is on Washington's over or something like that, or like the thing I fear right now with the Detroit lions is like everybody now liking the lions. It, it's, do, do you have any of those approaches? Or is that something that like you look out for or is almost like, you know, as far as, you know, consumption of content, what, what is your process in that regard? Yeah. So first of all, uh, I would separate um, sports betting content and football content um, because I think there is some good sports uh, sports betting content out there, like uh, your show, for example, or uh, um, Drew's and, and Andy's show is very good. But there's not very much good sports betting content because most of the guys uh, who do that are, or I get the sense that they are not actually betting and they mm -hmm. have actually no fucking clue what is what is happening in, in the marketplace. Um, so when it comes to gathering information that helps me handicapping games, I actually prefer non-sports betting content uh, where people who might not even be betting or don't know a lot, a lot about betting, but know much about the game. And they, they talk in an, I would, I would call it unbiased manner. They, they just straight up. They don't know what, what the total is what the spread is. They're just straight out talking what they are thinking about the actual football game. And I think that stuff um, helps me more than uh, listening to guys um, talking about, hey, the public is hammering the Eagles this week mm -hmm. and the Sharps on that side and stuff like that. Um, I think you guys also do a very good job uh, on like, I think it's the Thursday show where you go through all the matchups and talk about your bets. I think that stuff is very good. The Ringer is producing some good stuff. The Athletic Football Show. Um, there's also a German podcast that is very good at crunching matchups. So that stuff um, I usually prefer over simple um, sports betting content, to be honest. And you're talking about, you know, so give an example. So let's say we're breaking down, you know, um, I don't know, I just pick a random one. Let's say Bills, uh, Bills Rams this is the first game of the season. But you know, thinking about the actual, the actual matchup of this player or this unit versus this unit, right? Maybe there's, you know, some sort of injury or something across the Bills' offensive line, and you're thinking about how that might, you know, how the Rams might take advantage of that with with Aaron Donald, the different matchups in the secondary versus the receivers. 
that kind of a thing, the scheme, you know, the scheme matchup. And then what you're doing is you're taking that information and you're saying, okay, that gives me a good sense of what might actually happen from a football perspective. And and you're actually then using that to kind of create a number. Is that that's sort of what you're saying? Uh, basically, yes. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, like you guys probably as well, we are doing lots of season preparation work and we get a sense of uh, how good um, like um, every team might be, where the strengths and weaknesses of each unit, unit, what are our median priors or median expectations of each team. And then when, when teams um, play together, uh, play, play against each other, we have a general sense of um, where the strengths and weaknesses in each particular matchup are. And then it's basically like, getting to a number and then as as the week goes on like for example or uh, i could listen to the ring nfl show with benjamin solak i mean i'm, I'm not a, a huge uh, Warren sharp guy but i basically only listen uh, to that show because of benjamin solak and solak might have uh, one specific angle about a certain matchup that i have not really thought about yet mm. but which makes a lot of sense logically and i might incorporate that information and that uh, might um, help me um, adjust my number a little bit for example yeah that's such a great point right the, the idea isn't necessarily that like the benjamin solax which we've had on the show can tell you what it's worth but he can tell you in some ways where to look right for and to price out an, a, a thing or if it's even you know valuable at all like i've spent you know this this morning i've been working on like a a research project and like I thought you know and maybe I'm I you know I could have an error or something but like I was like I actually think this is going to be valuable the points by this year and I've done a decent amount of data wrangling I I you know and then I look and it doesn't add anything you know to and or at least like and, and but at least you know you know where to look right because it, it, ultimately when you're making bets in in sports there's two bets that you're making the one bet you're making is structural the kind of bet you're making is structural right so like you know, if, if anybody has, has followed along and teased, I believe yesterday, every both sides of any Wong teaser would have hit in every single preseason game yesterday, except for Dallas, who lost by 10 uh, against Denver. So, like, I don't know anything about these games, but I'm structurally betting it to your point earlier where, where the points aren't linear, and so, but the books have to offer you sort of a uniform offering so you can take advantage of that. There's there's aspects there where like the book is mispriced something based upon nothing other than a handicap. And then everything else is like you trying to, you know, you're, you're basically making a bet when you make a bet that the sports book is not incorporating something that matters it, it properly into the spread. And so like, it's probably too big of a job for an individual sports better to find all of those opportunities. Right. And so to, to take in content and be like, Oh yeah, that, that, maybe that matters. Then you go into your data and you wrangle it and try to figure out if there's a way that a, yeah. if it matters and B by how much. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about this season and maybe in the context of some of the things that have happened over the, the past couple of seasons, right? So some of these things that are true about the league, but you know, for kind of the duration of the year that you can take advantage of, you know, and, and, you know, home field advantage has been a good example of that, right. Um, quarterback play throughout the league. Are, are those things that you have leveraged, you know, in the past, obviously it's very tough to beat NFL lines. Right. And so, you know, are you leveraging those kind of macro um, factors? Are you trying to think through those? And if so, are there any that you're thinking about, you know, or ways that you're adjusting your mental model for this upcoming season? Obviously, we're, you know, we, we're out of the COVID stuff, so to speak, right now. Who knows if monkeypox will uh, will turn <laughs> will turn into uh, uh, another uh, shambles? But you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Like those kinds of things that if you can catch them early, uh, you can make a decent amount of money on if if the uh, if the market doesn't catch up to you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think uh, those um, macro level uh, viewpoints are very important. Like uh, two years ago in the COVID season, we had like this uh, crazy scoring boom over the first 12, 13, 14 seasons where um, EPA, I, I think EPA per dropback went up by like 0.04 over the course of the season. We had, uh, I think, more penalties early in the season against defenses. Uh, so penalties have, have, have changed. Um, I think 
also that NFL offenses have found ways to make it easier on young quarterbacks with all the emotion stuff, uh, play action stuff, which might also help uh, getting young quarterbacks or not as much experienced quarterbacks better help um, a pre-snap uh, where they are not consistently finding themselves in like these third and long in tough road environments. Um, um, early down passing stuff is, has also been very, very important. So, that that was some stuff where I took advantage of in the 2020 uh, season where totals have not really gone up as quickly enough. And I, I found myself betting lots of overs in 2020. But then last year, um, there was like scoring decreasing. Um, defenses were playing more to high shells and stuff like that. Quarterbacks in general had a harder time. Throwing, especially like I, th I think we had, we had a um, interesting shift at somewhere midpoint season. So early in the season, we still had like very high EPA per dropback levels. But then at some point during the season, I think somewhere week eight, nine, ten, we had like this um, de decreasing trend where offenses have gotten worse. And then I found myself in the situations where I suddenly have not found many good total plays anymore. So I've bet. Um, very less totals compared to, 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 to 2020. And when I look at the upcoming season, I think what's very interesting to me is, first of all, how the league is or, or how the scoring environment might change because of the um, focus of referees on the um, defensive holding penalties, like um, when you hold uh, um, players um, past five yards behind the line of scrimmage and that illegal contact stuff, that might have an impact when um, all of a sudden we have we could potentially have um, penalties skyrocketing early in the season. And then the league is going to come in. Hey, that's a little bit too much. That's reduces a little bit. And then we might have that um, maybe a decreasing wave um, after a, few, a couple of weeks. And what's all, also very interesting to me is how is the too high revolution changing the, the scoring environment this season? Because I think that the defenses are going to play even more mm -hmm. too high coverage this year which probably makes it, makes it even harder on the younger and inexperienced quarterbacks. I think good quarterbacks will long-term always find better solutions, like, solutions against that. And I also think we might find ourselves in the situation where, yes, teams are going to, or defenses are going to run more to high stuff and try to make it harder. But how are offenses going to counter? Our offense is going to be more uh, creative in the run game, um, our uh, offenses like the Bills, the, the Chiefs, um, the Chargers and stuff, are those teams finding more good plays against cover two, against two high looks? So I think that's very my my um, focus point when it comes to scoring environment going to the season. Yeah, that's. I think you you brought that up. And I, I think of, and actually this is something that um, I've been kind of wrestling with, and I hinted at this on the, on the show a little bit with George here. Um. Because I think that there are two possibilities, right? The one possibility, because we know that zone coverage, however you look at it, whether it's like NGS or PFF, all coverage data, or if you look at like Matt Harmon's reception perception, like getting open against zone coverages, and I and I guess you could play man with the two, you know, two man. I guess it would be like how you would play the two high stuff, mm -hmm. but like the more i guess the more that those two high looks be, are are like covered to, you know like it, the more zone those are i think the the less you get the game outcome that the point spread thinks right because you're you're there's so much more variance where there's so much there's so much you know, sort of the bias variance trade off right like there's less the bias matters less and the variance is enhanced in those games whereas when you have man coverage you know, we're far better able to determine who's good in man because mm -hmm. it's far more stable year to year. So, like, I think, you know, if you have teams that run a ton of man, you're going to get outcomes that reflect the pregame sped spread more often, right? So, but then at the same time, what you brought up is absolutely true, though, is, like, the two high stuff. You look at Zach Wilson and, like, when Mike White beat the Bengals last year and they asked him what was different, he's like, well, I just hit the check down, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> – and, so like maybe these young quarterbacks who are overzealous or something against the two high looks are, are going to hurt themselves because they're not taking what's available to them. Mm -hmm. For example, um, my, um, my, might be a hot take, but I think that the 
Dolphins offense might be equipped very well for that kind of defense because they can do so much stuff with their speed wide receivers and they can do so much damage after the catch where they might not be forced to come out with all different kind of complex concepts that might um, attack those coverages because they could basically just try to put their uh, wide receivers in great positions to do damage after the catch. That's yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Are you are you so are you high on how are you betting that thesis? Are you betting um you know, are you betting futures or are you saying, look, I'm going to actually, you know, I'm just going to bet the dolphins early. We've had this discussion a little bit because, you know, Eric and I like to talk about futures. I think futures are fun to talk about because you can you can really discuss your view on the team long term, right? But as far as betting, they're not a ton of fun because you just lock up your money for yeah. you know six months. Um, so, you know, is, first off, is that your thesis and how are, how are you going to, um, you know, like basically how are you going to bet it? Um, yeah, so I don't do a lot of futures. I've done more futures in the past, but especially the win totals, I didn't feel like, um, locking up so much money for like minus 110 bets, um, is a great allocation of resources when you could just use that stuff and uh, bet more on a week to week basis. I only bet some stuff uh, like Super Bowl futures or NFC futures. I also like to grab some stuff, um, during the season, buying the dip. Like, um, I thought my best futures were on the Bucks 2020 when they had like the, um, let's say bad stretch at some point mid season before their bye week. There, I got some very good value, but in general, I try rather to pick a few Super Bowl futures th than anything. For the Dolphins, I mean, I can absolutely see a scenario in which uh, Tua completely underperformed his expectations the last couple of weeks because the coaching on the offensive side, the offensive line and the wide receivers were so bad. And I also think there might be a scenario where his hip injury has still bothered him last season. And this year with an upgraded offensive line with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell and uh, Mike McDaniel, I, I would not be surprised to see some really good production out of that offense. Also, what, what I found interesting is that Tua increased his passing weight from a clean pocket to like 85 or something in his second year. So I think there's a quarterback who was touted as being very accurate coming out of college. And then he had two bad years coming off a crazy hip injury with some other injuries in season. Uh, we had a terrible offensive line with terrible wide receivers who could not catch the ball at all. And with a coaching staff that, um, especially in his first season, uh, didn't want him. I mean, um, it was clearly a Ryan Fitzpatrick offense and not a two attack by lower offense. So I think there's absolutely a scenario in which the Dolphins might surprise us, but at the same time might also have a very hard time making the playoffs in a tough AFC. Yeah, I think that there's, I mean, there, there's such an interesting question there about, you know, how much of the Shanahan system is Shanahan and how much of it is is structural. Um, but because if it's structural, then I think that you're right. I think Tua can really do things. And I think that the ability for them to, you know, be able to be multiple and have a lot of, you know, ta targets and stuff like that to guys like Gusecki and, uh, you know, Waddle in addition to Hill. Um, you know, the, 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 I think that the, the one question they have is like, do, do they run some of the RPO stuff? Do they run some of the play action stuff? And if they do, have we seen NFL defenses we've looked at in the tracking data? Have we seen NFL defenses simply stop recognizing the run, the run actions out of teams like the Niners and out of teams like the, you know, even the chiefs and, 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 you know, by, by extension, the Miami dolphins, because if they do, then the play action stuff and all that is, you know, they're, they're really going to have to commit to the run game then. Right. Because, you know, that's, I think what Shanahan's pretty good at, which is to say, we're going to commit to the run game because it does fundamentally set up the pass game that, that keeps the Niners from being a great offense. It, it makes mm -hmm. them a very good offense. Yeah. Um, you know, will Miami have the worst of both worlds there, which is that linebackers don't move. So it doesn't open up the passing lanes for Tua. And they're also not committed to running out of it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. What other, uh, you said you 
bet a few Super Bowl futures. Who who have you actually um, bet on so far this year? And are there any numbers that you actually still like um, from a futures perspective? So um, right before the show, I checked the odd screen and what I still like, I wanted to come up with your 49ers, honestly, but um, <laughs> at 16 Thank to you. one, uh, I think what we underestimate with the Niners is that even if Trey Lance is not a special quarterback in year two, there's still a very, very high floor in a Shanahan offense. I mean, um, I'm a little bit concerned about that interior offensive line, but Nick Mullins averaged like 0.13 EPA per drop pick in Shanahan's system mm -hmm. with um, worse skill position players than Trey Lance is going to have this year. And I think like, I mean, Trey Lance just has to come a little bit close to Jimmy Garoppolo as in terms of passing efficiency, I would guess to make this offense very good because even with Jimmy Garoppolo, it, that was like a borderline top five offense in 2019 and uh, 2021. So um, and then we have like this crazy upside if Trey Lance is actually good. I think mm -hmm. if Trey Lance is good, the Niners will be NFC favorites by like week five or something. Hmm. I really think that this offense with, with Shannon, with, with Kittle, Ayuk, who is going to, who's having a great camp from what I've been reading, and Debo Samuel, I think that can really be special because Trey Lance raises, also raises the floor in the run game significantly. Um, what I still like in the, in the AFC, are the Broncos at 20 to 1 and the Bengals at um, 21, 22 to 1 ish? Mm -hmm. um, I think at some point during the offseason, there were some, there was some talk about Russell Wilson being maybe washed or something. And I think that's completely hilarious to even think about. Um, I did a little bit of research on his mallet finger injury that he had uh, last year. And usually a mallet tendon rupture requires you to wear a stint for six weeks mm. during rehab. And then after the rehab, when you do sports, you are usually required to wear that stint six weeks more. But Russell Wilson not only had that um, uh, mallet finger, he also had like two fractures and, and, and a dislocation. And he was on the football field against the Packers after 37 uh, or, or 38 days. Mm -hmm. So he was clearly playing through an injury that he was not supposed to play through. And so even if we take away if a, a few weeks um, at, in the middle of the season where he was not supposed to play, and we look at like week one, weeks one to five, where he was one of the best passing quarterbacks in the league, I think he had the second highest um, PFF grade um, after week five, just after Tom Brady or something. And when we look at weeks one to five and weeks 14 to 18, he um, ranked 13th in EPA per, per dropback, 11th in passing grade, second in big time throw rate, sixth in turnover worthy uh, turn play rate. So if that's a rushed season or, or a down mm -hmm. season, um, I don't know. I don't know what a really rushed season would look like. And I, I think in Denver, Russell Wilson has a has a very sound offensive line. Uh, I mean, there's some uncertainty with um, how the scheme with uh, Nathaniel Hackett is going to work out, but. I like uh, Kurtland Sutton, uh, J.J. Judy, K.J. Hamler, uh, decent offensive line. I don't think he is going to have a worse supporting cast if all uh, as he had in Seattle. He, he might actually have. So we have that upside uh, that is going from a Pete Carroll team and a very, very conser hmm. conservative approach going to, to Nathaniel Hackett, who might actually let Russ cook indeed. Um, so I think Russell Wilson has always had that top 10 offense in him where no matter how good the offensive line for the Seahawks were, no matter what wide receiver he has lost. So I think that offense is going to be very good and the defense for the Broncos is not bad. I mean, they could need some health up front uh, with Rennie Gregory. Um, but overall, I think that's a defense that can, can be average and not do a lot of damage to them. And for the Bengals, I think we are overthinking this. Um, I mean, Joe Burrow, hmm came off an ACL and then he also had like two or three additional injuries last year during the season uh, where he had that uh, injury to his pinky then later in the season he had a knee sprain and despite all of that he uh, led the league in great from a clean pocket and um, when we I mean that might sound a, a little bit lazy but when we exclude uh, sacks and turnovers he led the league in EPA per dropback and now this year, he's going to get a much better offensive line. I mean, 
Uh, we know, especially because of the work that PFF has done, that quarterback controls much of the pressure and the sacks. But I think there's still a part that is signal that comes from the offensive line and going from the like one of the worst offensive line where uh, a lot of film guys that I really highly respect have said that there were a lot of communication issues between center, right guard, right tackle. They were, they were not picking up blitzes. They were not picking, picking up stunts and stuff like that. So if you now throw in a offensive line that can be average or even average plus that um, can, let's say, uh, drop the pressure rate from, I don't know what it was, let's say 35% to 31%. And Burrow, Burrow might actually improve his pressure to sack rate of 25% a little bit. I mean, then we are talking about about a sample size over maybe 600 dropbacks next season where he might be under pressure on uh, 30, 40, 50 less a, a actual dropbacks. And that might even raise that floor of that offense even higher and we are talking about Joe Burrow one of the best young quarterbacks best receiving group in the league average average plus offensive line a defense that is looking very versatile on paper I think they have a solid front seven versatile secondary um, I like what their DC has done in the playoffs when it, when it really matters so I think we might be um, just over complicating things with the Bengals and I also like them uh, better than the Ravens to win the, the division Wow. It, you, amazing that you didn't mention the offensive wizardry of Zach Taylor or the engine that makes that team go, which is Joe Mixon. Um, <laughs> you know, the fact that you're high on the Bengals without mentioning, you know, both of those guys really is impressive to me. All right. Before we get back to uh, Fabian and talk a little bit about the 2022 NFL season, a uh, reminder that this season is coming up quickly. There's still time, though, for you to get involved in the best kind of fantasy, which is underdog fantasy and best ball. The best ball format means you just draft and then you have to worry about that in-season madness, of picking people up, start, sit, all that stuff. Because the best ball format, they just pick the best score for each position in your lineup every single week. So you draft and then you win. Uh, they have Best Ball Mania 3, which is a tournament that allows you to take a shot at $10 million in total prizes. It's pretty sweet and it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg to enter. And here's the deal. If you use promo code PFF, when you sign up an underdog, your first deposit up to hundred dollars will be matched. And if you play $10 using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF plus subscription, which is ridiculous. It's an $80 value. So go make that happen at underdogfantasy.com or with the underdog fantasy app using promo code PFF. Also amigos, it's time to join the next generation of fantasy football with rain makers football. That's R E I G N makers football the first ever nft fantasy game from DraftKings. it's the only nft fantasy game licensed by the nfl players association now you can play all season for millions in prizes by building ultimate nft franchises right now everyone can get their full first roster starter pack for free play rainmakers it's very simple i'm trying to think about what this is like and it kind of reminds me of playing like pokemon or magic the gathering <laughs> you have like a squadron and you're kind of going up against someone else um, I only know that because I worked at a sports card shop as a kid. Uh, buy, sell, bid, and win player card NFTs for uh, the biggest names in the game through regular drops and auctions on the DraftKings Marketplace. Craft lineups of, lineups of athletes from your NFT collection and earn points for touchdowns, receptions, and more. It's just like daily fantasy football, but you have the really cool NFTs and construct your roster in a much more uh, holistic way. Build your NFT franchise and enter free Rainmakers football contests all season long to compete for millions and prizes. Here's how you do it. Download the DraftKings Daily Fantasy app right now. You can do it in any state because it ain't, it ain't uh, sports betting. Sign up with promo code PFF. Click the Rainmakers tile and opt in to get your first card free with promo code PFF. Plus, play for millions and prizes all football season while building the ultimate NFT franchise. So remember, download the app, Daily Fantasy app, promo code PFF, get your first card free, go dominate or go to DraftKings dot com for any more information you can use promo code pff right now on pff.com to get a pff plus subscription for 25 percent off it's a great deal go make it happen before the season gets started get everything at pff with one subscription pff plus unlocks all the great article content the fantasy football experience which is getting a brand new makeover in the coming weeks dare i say plus uh, rumor has it there's a pff app coming your way so all that plus grades and data from 2021 and before, including what will be the 2022 NFL season. PFF.com, 
and promo code forecast for 25% off. I, you know, I mean, and I'm, I'm curious, Eric, how you'd respond to this because so I, I definitely hear what you're saying in terms of the communication on the offensive line. I think that's a, that's one of those things where it's useful to know, you know, kind of the football angle without, you know, kind of the betting angle. Right. And, and that can be really helpful. One of the things that we've talked about a little bit is, you know, Burrow is just the type of guy who do, he, he just never wants to die. Right. Like he, mm-hmm. he just will sit back there and wait. I mean, one of the reasons that he's gotten injured is that he will take any hit. It does not matter. You know, the dude is really tough. And, you know, will he just have more of that because he's got a better offensive line and he's just going to continue to, you know, he'll, mm-hmm. he'll be more patient. He'll still take those hits. I think that'll be interesting, you know, to see. But the other thing is, are we, or should we be so bullish on communication improving with new pieces? You know, continuity, one of the things that, that Eric has studied is, you know, continuity mattering for offensive mm-hmm. lines and, you know, there will be some movement there. So, um, you know, you add you add into that the fact that I think Zach Taylor got a little lucky last year from an offensive perspective where he had mm-hmm. Joe Burrow making a lot of plays. And this, you know, this year, I, the teams are not they're not going to sneak up on anybody. And so Zach Taylor's offensive scheme, you know, and, and his play calling is going to have to overcome some of that. And I'm not sure, you know, a guy that enjoyed running on second and long so much is is poised for that. But I don't know, Eric, did did um, Fabian sway you in any way on on the bungles? I like the Bengals at, four, at 22 to one. Um, you know, we, we said that on the show too. I, I think that this is a testament to the betting markets getting better. You know, like we, we've had to answer this question a lot on various shows, which is, what do you think of the Bengals? And I, my, my, my answer is always on average, I think that they're going to be a better team that finishes with a worse outcome than they had the year before. Mm-hmm. And like people get mad at that, but like that's baked into the market right now, right? Like they are not getting the Super Bowl hangover bump, right? Like the 49ers when they lost in 2019 and 2020, what was there? Like 10 to 1, 12 to 1, right? Um yep. obviously the Chiefs last year were the favorite after losing the Super Bowl. You know, the Bengals are you're getting 22 to 1, you know, in some places. So I agree with that. I think um this is another aspect of you're, you're the part of the handicap is the structural advantage of the Bengals and teams like the Chargers have over teams like Kansas City, Buffalo, soon, soon Baltimore, you'd hope, um, where like they can just they can plug the, the you know, the this is a game about weak links and they can make they can pay more for the weak links than the other teams can. Right. They can make better bets or easier bets um, with with what they have. So I do think they're going to be better. I mean, I think my biggest issue, and I know, you know, George, I've never, I haven't gone to a Bengals game with George since our, our mm-hmm. first year here. Uh, but I, I think I can entice him to one of these if he's in town. Mm-hmm. Think about this is the end of the season for the Bengals at Steelers, at Titans, home to Chiefs. George will want to go to that one. Yeah. Uh, home to Browns, at Bucks, at Patriots, Bills at home, Ravens at home. So, like, I've always come back to this and said, okay, how much of a cushion? And they have an easier first half of your schedule for sure. Steelers, not, you know, Steel, they have Jets, uh, Dolphins, Falcons, Saints, uh, Panthers early. But like that end of season schedule, they better like have a decent lead going into it or be fundamentally great. Because if there's any, like the last year's team doesn't go through that schedule and finish above 500, right? Like that, that I think is the, the tricky part about them because they at the same time had a ton of advantages last year with schedule, like some luck, you know, mixed in there, but then they were also pretty good at things. And then they got better at the things they sucked at. So, you know, it's, it's really tricky to sort of like add a and subtract B. Yeah. I I also think that when you look at their um, schedule, like I would not be completely shocked if they, were in the first place in the AFC in like uh, November 27th. So that starting schedule is pretty manageable. I mean, I think uh, Saints and Dolphins might actually be the the uh, the strongest opponents. So Browns probably without Deshaun Watson if, if his suspension uh, gets expanded. So there is a scenario in which the Bengals are going to have a very good record going into December and then they might drop a few games later in the year. The interesting thing, 
you look at that division last year. The the I do feel that the Bengals got very lucky last year. <laughs> you know, I mean, Joe Burrow took so many freaking sacks, and yet they ended up winning a division. You think about how that happens. How do they make it to the Super Bowl? You know, they had Lamar Jackson and the Ravens get absolutely torched by injury. Uh, the Browns and Baker Mayfield torched by injury. Right, and they do is playing with like half his body. Right, um, Ben Roethlisberger was the quarterback of the other team <laughs> in this division. <Yeah. laughs> so, it, like, you know, I, I do, I do think a lot about for the Bengals. How would this team have fared in a kind of normal situation? And that includes the playoffs too. I mean, you know, the Derek Carr figuring out how to, you know, actually manage end of game situation. They might not have made it out of the, the home playoff game that they had. You had a Chiefs complete and utter meltdown. I mean, well, one of the greatest. Of two, true. two Chiefs meltdown. Yeah, but yeah. the one in the playoffs was, I mean, unconscionable, the, the melt that yeah. that was, and, and gets them to the Super Bowl, um, you know, where they were winning the game and, you know, had an opportunity to win, right? Like continued to get a little bit of luck there in terms of an injury. I don't want to make it sound like it was all luck, but I do think that variance last year was very, very much on their side. Um, you know, just even thinking it, it, watching Jamar chase and, you know, the number of incredible catches that that guy made. Um, and so, you know, I, I could see them actually improving as a team this year, but those other things coming back to earth and it being a hell of a lot harder, you know, and, and them mm. scrapping for a, a wild card in, you know, if they're not winning that division, the wild card, you just talked about the Broncos, you know, that, that whole AFC yeah. West very, very strong. So, um, you know, if they're not winning the division, and I think the Ravens, um, you know, certainly present a, a strong case, maybe not the Browns this year, but you never know about the Steelers if they get a real quarterback, then all of a sudden it's kind of a, it's kind of a fight. Um, I want you to, you know, we have a lot of really um, intelligent and smart uh, betters that listen to the podcast. And yet, you know, not, a, not many of them are, are able to bet, you know, professionally or do it with a, you know, have a ton of time to do it. So, curious how you would you know knowing obviously what the betting space looks like you've got people betting same game parlays left and right obviously on on sports books like what's the you know for someone that wants to do the right thing right wants to enjoy it you know it obviously gives you skin in the game it makes sundays a hell of a lot more fun knowing that that's the goal even for people that are taking it seriously um but have a, obviously other jobs and other things that take up their time what's your advice like what are some of the things that you think would make sense for you know, a, a better that wants to enjoy it, obviously not doing it as a, as a profession, um, but also wants to be intelligent about it. Yeah. So it, it depends uh, how much deposable uh, money someone has, but if we has some money to spend, I would probably recommend opening as many accounts as possible um, in the legal space and also trying to get some uh, PPH accounts because line shopping is probably key. I think line shopping and um, consistently trying to grab the best number can turn someone from minus two ROI over the long term to a, a net, net uh, not losing better, which makes it, I, I would guess, a lot more entertain, entertaining to bet on games. So that would probably be my number one advice. So don't try to chase too many games on Sunday mornings betting into uh, six-figure markets, um, try to pick up, when we are talking about the NFL, try to pick up some games um, over the course of, of the week and try to pick up just the bad number, uh, best numbers. So sometimes a game could move from like three and a half to three and uh, 20 minutes later, you could still grab that three and a half on a PPH account. So that will probably make anyone who just wants to bet for entertainment purposes um, help that would help um, people lose less money over the over the long term and maybe win some money. Yeah, you you bring up such a good point because there's also an aspect of getting as many outs as possible. And like we live in Ohio here, we're gonna have legal sports betting sometime. I believe in January, if I'm not mistaken. So you know, right in time for the playoffs, and then obviously March March Madness a few years or a few months later. But like you get a couple of things in the states, right? Which is like you have these sign up bonuses, you have the the boosts and stuff like that and you really do have to be careful because a lot of these places like i know that there was the the ross tucker you know will a lot offensive lineman score this week boost and it wasn't even like you know it was it was basically you know 
called a boost when it wasn't actually even like a value at all. Yeah, the true price was like, you know, implied was was wrong. But but you have the boosts, you have the the you know just the bonuses that you'll get to sign up for these books, and then you all and then you know then you also have some books are just better than that, right. So like if you have a a bar stool book, they're going to charge you a ton for a teaser, for example. Whereas you know some PPHs are still offering. I have one that has you know minus one ten teasers, right? So <laughs> now you know when you're doing teasers in the preseason or you get a, a Wong opportunity during the season, like you have an out that's not offering you minus one twenty or minus 150 in some cases you have one that's offering minus 110 which you can live yeah. with um it's such good advice because like again i think you know if we view sports betting two ways you have structural advantages which are just like the sports book can't possibly handcraft every line for you so there's going to be some inequalities uh whether you know just sitting there for you and then handicapping um having more sports books by definition means you're going to have more of an opportunity at the first thing, which takes no handicapping talent at all. Yeah. And even if you cannot get uh, too many sports books on your own, I think what's very important in this space is um, networking. So mm -hmm. um, you will always find people who can or, or would like to bet stuff for you. So let's say you are in a certain state where there's no draft, draft kings or FanDuel, but uh, there are some very good markets for certain events. You can, um, connect with someone who has those accounts in those states and um, you can start a simple betting partnership even if it's um, not for uh, big tickets but just having some fun and um, betting some stuff for some certain sport events yeah no that's a good point I what's interesting in looking at um, you know a lot of the research out there on people that are betting Today, and you know, I wonder about this a lot because you look at something like Amazon, for example, which is where everyone buys everything. And you know, how how price sensitive are people, right? Is it you know, mm. does it really matter if you get two day shipping? Right? Like what it what it really costs? Everything is is relatively the same price, and it's you know twenty percent or fewer depending on the state of people are actually price shopping, right? Like those yeah. you know those things are it requires you to as you said have a lot of sports accounts open. It requires you to monitor all of them. You know, what's really fascinating about the sports betting space, it's so nascent that a lot of these things take a lot of time, you know, and that's something that increasingly is um, being used up more and more given all the things and, and all the, um, you know, different distractions that there are for people in, in the, uh, in the world. And so, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's interesting to me because the way that you think about it and the way that you put that is very sensible. And, you know, we talk about it a lot on the show and yet for a lot of people that are out there actually doing this on a, you know, increasingly frequent, more frequent basis, it's just not something that they're able to do efficiently or effectively, you know? And, and I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's really a question or anything, but I do think it's interesting and whether we'll see that um, eventually become more of the common betters practice or whether there will be a way for them to do it and if they actually care right if amazon for sports betting existed would people actually care about 10 cents or you know like i, I guess that's the that may be the question there and and i don't know if you um have an answer or if you want to opine on that but uh it's fascinating to think about where sports betting will go both in the united obviously in the united states where it's um it's currently really young yeah I think sports betting in general in the United States, especially is making giant steps, but this specific mindset that you have talked about for betters is probably only doing baby steps. Like mm -hmm. uh, we will probably need a lot more time to get to the point where there's a fair share of betters, let's say in the United States who are actually caring and thinking about that stuff. Like where can I get the best prices? Where can I make the best bets and stuff like that? So basically just betting education, because I think lots of people, they just want to get a few picks every week, throw some money in there. They don't care whether it's Barstool or DraftKings or an offshore or something like that. And I also think that people in general are lazy. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I talked to someone from Georgia and he has, I think one or two PPH accounts. And he never even thought about getting anything else because he has his, his book in town. That's a process that's um, 
uh, been there for five for five years or something, some famili familiarity. You don't need to uh, deal with offshores and maybe um, digging to Bitcoin or, st or stuff like that. So I think that there's that element that people will probably need more time to develop that mindset because of various reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's and that and that's the thing. I think that the. I think we we have to do probably on this podcast maybe maybe delineate a better you know better with you know what what folks are wanting to do right because like I think like to your point basically if you do uh, you know and we've had we're, we're gonna have Rob Zola on here at some point but like if you do all like the what I would consider like bet stamp thing which is like find the no hold market right and you do all that kind of stuff and you're terrible at handicapping you're just not gonna lose that much money you know, you're going to lose probably um, just given that, like, it's like, but you're going to be like 1% better than, you know, than uh, the, the hold of the market. And over time, it's going to keep you in the game longer. You know, some people might not think that that's actually worth it, but then, you know, if you get 1% closer based upon like having better books and, have, you know, and, and being able to line shop, taking that extra time. And then you, and then you somehow craft out a 1.5% angle, a 1.5% angle is not going to be enough to win when you don't do any of those other things. If you're just like, if you have player prop, you know, you have an uh, PPH that offers 20 cent lines on player props, like that's not even close to enough, right? But mm -hmm. if you have a, a number of different ones where you're betting into a no hold market and then you also have an edge, then you that's when you can win. Yes. And I think that that's, yes. you know, maybe, maybe when we're talking to people, that's, you know, for some, that's just too much time and effort to care. But for people who are actually trying to, you know, maybe Jordan and I need to do a better job, I think, of like saying, OK, if you're actually trying to win at this, you need to be yeah, obviously taking this this part of the content in, which is great ideas, but also the secondary part, which is just the actual execution of the thing. But it's so hard. I guess that's the that's the interesting thing is as it becomes easier. Right. Right now, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, think about how easy it is to do 99 percent of the the things that people do in their free time, right? And it, find me something that people do in their free time that's hard, like out of their own volition. You know, you can barely get people to work out, you know, and in a hard way. Like everything I see on uh, social media is like, hey, here's this way that you can not really put in effort while you're working out and get great results. Like it, it, it's actually absolutely amazing, right? It'll be, it'll be a thing that's that it was, world, a, it was a fad that was, um, it was like, do you hate cardio? good news all you have to do is walk for 30 minutes at an incline and like you get all the cardio you need and i was like I, I, you know people are <laughs> to your point people are lazy people are also incredibly stupid yeah. and but the the point remains that if it's not easy it's going to be very hard to get people to do it right and you know because of how confusing the regulations are right now you know where technology is at from a sports betting standpoint it's not easy to to do right now Looking at like Australia and Europe, though, and you've probably seen this price sensitivity and price shopping is something that that you see, you know, it, it's it's not incredibly prevalent, but you see it a hell of a lot more there, similar to how you see in game betting, right in in Europe and Australia, more mature markets, it, it's a overwhelming majority of the handle, whereas in the United States, it's it's nowhere near at that, you know, that um, it's not even like 30%. So it is interesting to think about the way that it could follow that market and we'd make it easier for people to do that. You know, they will be able to do it. Um, but right now it's just, you know, it's like, you're just not going to get someone to, you know, to, to go make that move. It's just, it's, it's a pain in the ass. It's a, it's a time suck. Do you bet um, uh, in game uh, live at all Fabian? And, and if so, what's your process there? um up until up until this point only a little bit like uh, sometimes when i watch a standalone game um i just try to bet some stuff in game intuitively just to um get the degen in me a little bit more uh to sweat so to say but there is no like sophisticated uh, thought process behind that that's, that's like uh... that's like this <laughs> it's so funny you know it's sort of you know, you're so used to like squeaking out the the wins, right, all the time. And then, like, I always find sometimes the urge. It, it, you said it like there's the, a degenerative like instinct of like, oh yeah, I'm up. You know, I'm up on this game. 
you know, and, and that's boring. You know, like I, I kind of want, you know, like so yesterday it was a CFL game where I bet over and it was like over the first half. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to double down on this and bet over second half, too, because there's no way these teams slow <laughs> down. And then they had like six points in the third quarter. And like, <laughs> you're like, ah, oh, crap. But ultimately, luckily, the, it, it worked out for me yesterday. But you know what I'm saying? Like, there's always this. And I think the best, you know, and, and it certainly comes out in you and, you know, the, the, the people, you know, Drew, we've had Drew and Andy on, Rob, Rob, and everybody who does this, I think, well, is is competitive. And so there's like that sort of aspect of like, even when you win a bet, you kind of want a live bet, you know, just to like, you know, pour it on a little bit or. Uh, you know, like if you get behind, you know, sort of double down on your own, uh, you, you know, your own mistake, I guess, or or miscalculation or just bad luck. You want that um, thrill. Which of course, is bad process, too. Yeah, you want that thrill. I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, similarity to uh, actually. So what you're talking about, Eric, like that's that's uh, people that are really disciplined, kind of acting more like the the kind of normal betting population does, I think throughout the general, you know, uh, cadence of the week and pregame bets, right. It's like, Oh, I'll, I'll wake up on Sunday and I'll bet this game. You know, it might be irrational. I might, you know, there might be no sense to it, but I want that, you know, I want that extra juice. And, you know, it's getting back to our previous point about like being disciplined and price shopping and all. And for example, trying to try selling someone the idea that, you know, getting a 1% edge is, is worth, you know, hours of their time. <laughs> you can't, you can't even do that in investing, right? Think about that. I mean, you know, uh, try and convince someone who's a retail investor to buy index funds, at, you know, with a low cost ratio versus buying individual stocks in the moment when they hear news about them, right? Like you can't, you know, and, yeah. and by and large, the kind of retail investing um, technology has supported all of those other things, right? You know, where Robinhood makes it, for example, really easy for someone to place an option trade. And that person has no business placing an option trade. They have no idea what they're doing. Um, and it's kind of similar, you know, I, I, I do think for, you know, it, given the fact that investing in the market is prob probably viewed a little more seriously than betting for most people in terms of what it means for their future. You know, if you can't get people to do things rationally there, good luck, you know, in, yeah. in betting, right? Like good luck calling, you know, I think there's a lot of it where, you know, it, people are doing it and we are doing that in game in a lot of situations for the added thrill, the added engagement, you know, and um, what you're going to do there is act very differently than if you're doing it to try and make, you know, a, a lot of money over a 30 year time horizon. Yeah. Uh, um, Fabian, tell everybody where they can find all of your good content um and uh pimp anything new if you have uh if you have something to to talk about um let the good people know yeah so you can you can find me on twitter at s u u m a 810 um i'm going to be on the matchbook nfl show weekly um which streams on i think thursday uh 2:30 new york time it's with uh, Drew Dinsick and Rob Pizzola uh, and Sally from Matchbook. And I will also be on some other podcast shows, um, et cetera, during the season. So best thing is always to hit me up on the Twitter timeline. Hopefully we'll have you back here and maybe we can do uh, some guessing of the lines together now that we know, now that we know that you're a brother in Christ or brother in price. <laughs> I don't know what the hell we're going to call it at this point. We've gotten, we, do you have any suggestions for us? We're dealing with this issue as maybe you've heard where Simon Hunter has ruined the word syndicate. I mean, it is to the point where now every time I hear it, I just, you know, wretch. But any thoughts on what we could, a, a good name to restore the, the value of our, our listenership? Uh, maybe how about the group or something like that? Okay, something simple. See, that that was the more simple side and I resonate with the simplicity. I've gotten a lot because Eric started this whole Brothers in Christ movement. And so now every other <laughs> suggestion is bros in this or brothers in this or brethren here and it's like let's <laughs> simplify a little bit i have a, i the the one that somebody sent me and i have to make sure um i give this person their due because uh it was absolutely amazing but they gave out like four or five of these to me and the first one which i i kind of really like which is the illuminazi <laughs> wow I, I feel like that. I feel like the fact that George, like, you know, you're going to laugh every time you say it sort of similar to how we laughed at syndicate. 
at first because it was tongue in cheek until somebody you know, completely ruined it. Illuminati feels feels. I I agree that nothing that has to do with like a current joke can yeah. go in, but um, I <laughs> also like. I mean, I also like what's wrong with just the Illuminati? <laughs> what's that? <laughs> what's wrong with just the Illuminati? I kind of, you know, <laughs> I kind of because the whole thing with the syndicate was it was a little tongue in cheek, you know, and um. So I, I don't know. That was very creative. I appreciate the creativity. There's no doubt about it. Um, Fabian, this was fantastic. Thank you for staying up uh, late with us. And we look forward to all of your great content, having you back on here uh, during the season and talking more about uh, about the NFL. So thank you, brother. Of course, guys. Thanks for having me.